Now, uh, but this is the approach they make. They say, well, you can't, you can't claim you. Who are you? How arrogant, how prideful. How dare you to think that you have the exclusive rights to the truth? Okay. And what they've done is they've set up a straw man. They've set up a fallacy to begin with. And then they beat you up with it. Um, <laughs> it's not like the idea that how, how boastful, how dare we you know, who are we to think that, that this planet is the only one with intelligent life that there's billions of galaxies, there's billions of worlds there's, there's got to be intelligence out there somewhere right, how dare we say as if somehow we've got this earth centric arrogance or something right, you know, well well, why would there be more than one world? When you understand the purpose for this world, we don't need any more. All right? To resolve the angelic conflict for the maximum glory of Jesus Christ. There requires no additional worlds. It only requires this one. And, uh, you know, with all due respect to the folks that magnify animals and plants and other things, dolphins and whatnot, uh, they are animal intelligence and whatnot, uh, they're not human intelligence. They're not human, uh, the realm of humanity that's made in the image and likeness of God. The redemptive purpose of God came through the man, Christ Jesus. All right? The man, Christ Jesus. And so the, uh, the animal crowd doesn't like that. But it is what it is. Okay? So the idea of exclusivity is not, it shouldn't strike us as odd. It should not strike us at all. What should strike us as odd is how pluralism has gained uh, such a, a dominant role in the world in just the, the short 19th and 20th centuries that it has. You know, even the unbelievers prior to the 19th century weren't stupid enough to fall, fall for pluralism. Okay. Interesting. All right. On your quiz, you're going to want to know these four, the difference between pluralism, relativism, ex inclusivism, and exclusivism. It's actually unfortunate that inclusivism is not um, expanded further. I really wanted more on this. When he said, one religion is explicitly true and all others are implicitly true. Okay. What do you mean by that? Explain. How is that? If one is explicitly true, how could the others be implicitly true? Especially if this one you're saying is explicitly true tells you that the others are false. In which case, they're false. They can't be implicitly true. They are mutually exclusive. Christianity and Islam cannot both be true because their texts are mutually exclusive. Jesus is either the Son of God, Redeemer of mankind, or he's not. And so uh, the, you can't have Christianity explicitly true and Islam implicitly true is not possible. All right, so pluralism, the belief that every religion is true, that each provides a genuine encounter with the ultimate. What is that? An encounter with the ultimate. You know, in many of these, what they, what they also clue you into the fact is that they are trying to redefine biblical Christianity in such a way, as a, on a straw man basis, to then beat it up. Really? Is that what biblical Christianity is? We've come here this morning, we've come here this evening for an encounter, a genuine encounter with the ultimate. Is that why we're here tonight? Okay. Now, how about to be, to be reconciled to God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ? How about to be chosen, to be called, to be predestined. We're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. <laughs> There's no other religion on earth that even claims to do that. So how can they be equivalent? One may be better than the others, but all are adequate. In other words, find what works for you. They all get the job done, one way or the other. But I, that's total blasphemy. There are not 20 ways. There are not a thousand ways. There are not even two ways. There is one way. And I can prove that because Jesus Christ went to the cross. And it's just, it's just logical. Understand that. 
If there was a plan B that was adequate, if there was some alternative that could have worked other than the cross, then that's what God the Father would have done to save his son, to keep his son from doing what he had to do on the cross. But when Scripture says that he must suffer, when Scripture says he must go to the cross, as we saw this morning, that's a have to. And the reason why it's a have to is because there is no plan B. There is no alternate. There is no second way, third way, fourth way, fifth way. God didn't say, well, just go be a Molech worshiper or be a, be a you know, follow Zeus or uh, Jupiter or whatever. No. I am the way, the way, one and only. The truth, one and only. The life, one and only. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's exclusivity. And if the world hates you for it, oh well. You're being faithful to the truth. You're being faithful to the text. And we can appreciate that. All right, relativism. Similar to pluralism. <laughs> uh, both relativism and pluralism say it doesn't matter. Whatever works for you. Okay? Um, pluralism says it doesn't matter. Whatever works for you because they're all basically true anyway. Relativism says, whatever, it doesn't matter, whatever works for you, because none of them are true anyway, right? They're all false. There is no truth. So, who cares? Relativism is similar to pluralism, claiming each religion is true to the individual who holds it. So it's true for you, and it works, so have fun, but it's not absolutely true because there are no absolutes. Relativists believe that since there is no objective truth in religion, there are no criteria by which one can tell whether religion is true or which religions are false. There's just no way to know. No one can. And it doesn't really matter anyway because none of them are true objectively. They're all relatively true to the person that holds it. So pluralism says, doesn't matter. Do what you want. They're all true anyway. Relativism says, whatever. Do what you want. None of them are true anyway. <laughs> All right. And then this bizarre inclusivism, which I really wish that he had expanded upon. He, he never does, not, not ever again in this chapter. Actually, not ever again in the four volume set. If you do a, uh, a, a search for inclusivism, um, you're going to get this chapter and the index of the back that points to this chapter. And you're going to get two, uh, the only two hits are right there in the paragraph heading and right there in the. Uh, that spent it right there. So, in any event, if anybody of you personally knows Norman Geisler, I ask him maybe if he can. Uh, <laughs> he accepted my Facebook friend request, by the way. But I think it's just an organizational thing. He's probably got an intern or grad student somewhere that's uh, maintaining his Facebook page. I, uh, I freely confess this tonight. I broke my rule. I broke my own rule. In my history of Facebook uh, participation, I have never once sent somebody a friend request that I do not personally know. I've never glommed on to celebrities or famous people or whatnot. If I haven't met them, if I'm not friends with them in the real world, I don't want to be friends with them in the fake world. All right. As far as that goes. All right. And then finally, the fourth one, the one we want to talk about tonight, the one that makes sense, is exclusivism. The belief that only one religion is true and all the others opposed to it are false. And as I said before, that's, that's the only one that conforms to reality. That's the only one that conforms with existence. Who we are and how we think and how we live. And uh, it, it just, it boggles the mind. Only, uh, uh, the, the, I think it's the frantic denial of anything associated with God that this cosmos hates. This cosmos hates that God defined marriage. And so they try to find their own definitions. Hates God's definition of family, and they, they do all this other stuff. They, they hate God's definition for nations. Boundaries, they point at times of their habitations and the boundaries of their habitations. They hate that. Anything that God established, they hate it. For no other reason than the fact that God established it. And so they hate it. And this idea of exclusivism. Only one religion is true. All the others opposed to it are false. See? 
Because remember, the fundamental issue on Satan's rebellion is I will be like the Most High God. I can become an acceptable alternative. And, and the whole angelic conflict is played out as an expression of that in so many ways. Well, of course, one is, and that's the nature of reality. Truth is exclusive. And, and, and I, I think it's ludicrous to think otherwise. If, uh, if, if I was to become convicted that the Bible was false and the Quran was true, well, what would, what would you expect then? Right? Allahu Akbar, call me a Muslim. I'm going to have to convert. Because of a, of a conviction that this is true, this is false. Okay? I'm not like going there, relax. All right? But I'm saying, it, it's nonsensical to reject all forms of truth or to accept some pluralistic, inclusivistic... There is no experience in, earth, in, in, in daily life or anything other than the abstract realm of these morons in, in, in philosophy departments of, of, and these book writers that, that try to convince you of these things. Normal people don't, don't think in those terms. And so fortunately, I, I think for our applications, like I say, the folks you're going to meet at Starbucks or you know, at the mall or wherever you go, Okay, uh, you know, they're gonna, they'll have a, a frame of reference to understand that what is is and what isn't isn't, and 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 we're good with all the rest of that. All right. <laughs> By the way, um, there was a reference here to uh, a journal, theological journal, by uh, an author by the name of McGrath. And if you are interested, if you want more on this. Uh, just shoot me an email and I can email it to you. I do have this available in my software, so it's simple enough to simply uh, export it to PDF. I already made a PDF out of it, so just ask me and, and uh, okay, I see two raised hands. I'm not going to remember. All right, I'm going to go home tonight and forget all those raised hands. So send me an email. I'll reply to your email with the, because uh, I'm going to forget. Your email will be the reminder. The email will also be the, the mechanism by which when I hit reply, I attach the PDF but this is in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society. Uh, it goes back to September of 1992 when this was first published. It actually it comes in two parts. And I put both part one and part two into the same PDF. Even though uh, guys only quotes from part one here in, uh, in his article. But it's the challenge of pluralism for the contemporary Christian church. And it, it really does a good job kind of expanding upon what I'm doing tonight. Uh, describing why it is a challenge. You know, if you think about it, do we really, does this really bother us? Should this bother us? Are you tempted to just simply say, well, <laughs> you guys are morons. We have the truth. So there. You know, um, I think we should look upon the field, see that they're white for the harvest. I think that we should have a heart to seek and to save the lost. I think that we should have a, a heart that weeps over, over what Christ weeps over. And we may not be challenged to debate with them or argue with them or, or convince them they're wrong or prove, prove that they're stupid. But what we can do, <laughs> okay, is at least understand what they're, what they're trapped by and at least have a, 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 the facility to converse with them. To, to maybe mention something that says, you know, really? You hold to that view? Then how do you deal with this? And if nothing else, you just, again, you, you spark something for them to think about. And then uh, they're going to go home at 3 in the morning, they're going to say, yeah, how do I deal with that? <laughs> right? It is kind of fatal to my thinking that uh, it's not possible. So it is the challenge of pluralism for the contemporary Christian church. And then part two is in the, uh, the, next, ep in the next issue, the uh, December issue of that same year. And it's called The Christian Church's Response to Pluralism. So there's the challenge and then there's the response. Anyway, both parts I think are good. I like it. It's, it's better than just sitting around grumbling about how terrible things are. Okay, fine. You got an article telling us how terrible things are. Got it. What do we do about it? What's the answer? What, what, you know, how do we respond? How should we minister to people that are in that, in that lost position? 
So I recommend both part one and two, and when I email you that PDF, you'll have uh, you'll have both parts. All right.